Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you all uh, to this workshop today, uh, organized by Gudera in association with Academy Street Workshop. It will be on 10 fundraising mega tips, and it's my pleasure to welcome Kevin, who will be hosting this workshop. So, hi, Kevin. Hi, thank you. All right, great. Uh, I'm Deepti. I'm, I'm uh, heading nonprofit partnerships and good, at Good Era, and I'd be handing over to Kevin shortly. But before that, especially for those of you who are new to Good Era, I just want to take five minutes to quickly walk you through on what Good Era is and how are we creating impact for our nonprofit partners. So just give me five minutes uh, for this. Um, all right. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, Kevin, is my screen visible? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so let's let's start with understanding Gudera from a numbers point of view. Uh, so Gudera, uh, we are a tech-based company and we are leading the revolution in corporate volunteering space through technology. Uh, we are currently working with over 200 clients across different geographies, 50 out of which are Fortune 500. And all of this is just possible uh, through the support of our vast nonprofit network. We are working with over 50,000 nonprofits from across 100 plus uh, countries. These nonprofits focus on, they support a lot of cause areas, right? From racial equity to gender uh, equality, to women empowerment, to environment, to so all sorts of cause areas. Uh, and also supporting a wide variety of beneficiaries from children, youth, women, elderly, um, et, et cetera. So yeah, uh, uh, 10 million plus uh, beneficiaries that these nonprofits are supporting. Uh, it, Talking specifically about our partners in Ireland and UK, uh, these are uh, some of our partners here in this region. And as you can see from all across, you know, different cause areas, um, Down syndrome, cancer, autism, uh, environment, and all of those. I hope you're able to recognize some names out of these. Um, and now, uh, so we at Gudera, we help our corporate partners uh, uh, connect with the right charities and uh, figure out the right volunteering opportunities for their employees according to their employees' own preferences. Uh, but from a nonprofit side of uh, things, there are a lot of ways uh, through which we create positive impact for our nonprofit partners. So I'll just talk about some of these ways. The first one is obviously uh, through uh, helping our nonprofit partners get access to skilled volunteers. So this is just an example. Uh, of one of our partners, Seal Rescue Island. They needed help with their social media. So we gathered around, uh, gathered around some volunteers who created you know, beautiful illustrations to um, help Seal Rescue spread awareness about their cause and about their organizations through their social media. The second uh, very important, very critical uh, thing for our nonprofits is, uh, you know, spreading the word about their, about their uh, charity, right? So that's where we participate in. Uh, we lead a lot of brand advocacy initiatives for our nonprofit partners. Um, so uh, not just through our own social media handles and website, but also through our partners um, and third party platforms like Tribe Global, Forbes, we continuously, you know, weekly, monthly, we uh, highlight uh, our key nonprofit partners and why uh, highlight the reasons why companies should support these nonprofits. And not just that, even be going beyond that, um, getting our volunteers and our clients to speak up about these nonprofits. Right, the right hand side, you can see Anna talking about a wonderful experience that she had while volunteering with Deaf Roots, uh, which is a nonprofit partner of Gudera. Uh, the third thing, which is more in line with our session today is uh, corporate matching gifts programs. Uh, so this is an example of one of our partners, see with charity, they were able to raise over ten thousand uh, dollars from a U.S.-based tech giant through their Dollars for Doers program. So, Dollars for Doers program uh, is a program in which a company will donate a certain amount for every employee who volunteers. So, for this program was specifically very successful so for CUS charity, and just wanted to highlight that. And uh, this is the last thing, uh, and then uh, you know I, I uh, um, hand it over to Gavin, but. Um, one way uh, uh, that we support our nonprofit partners is also through this community, which is uh, called the Karma Community. It is a closed Facebook group, and we uh, at Gudara we share a lot of uh, immensely helpful resources for all our partners to be consumed through this community. 
we also organize a lot of sessions just like these but more exclusive in nature just for the community as well so if you are keen on receiving these notifi notifications uh, or participating in these sessions or getting access to these resources do join karma community you can scan this qr code or you can also just uh, type uh, karma community uh, in your facebook window and you'd be able to uh, find us hopefully so that's it that i had from my side um and just one thing to rem remember throughout throughout the session let's try to make it as interactive as possible so at any moment um, if you have any questions about godera about uh, you know uh, any topic that kevin is talking about feel free to type it out in the chat window and we'll address it then and there or we will take it at, at the end of the workshop so that's pretty much it from my side thanks uh, uh, thank you all for taking our time for this workshop and uh, over to you kevin the stage is yours thanks deeply um let me just share my screen and get going um okay is that okay for everybody can we can we can you see my screen okay okay perfect um okay um well um oh bear with me one second uh, Oh, that's okay. It's fine. Um, okay. Well, um, hi everybody, and um, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm really happy to be here and to to meet some of the organisations that are working with Gadira. And thanks, Gadira, for inviting me. It's actually I'm really um, happy to partner with with Gadira, and it's just on the on the basis that over the last year or two, I've had so many organisations coming to me trying to connect better with um corporates and and businesses and it can be very difficult and i think you know it, it's tools like and uh, being able like Odera, where you can connect for specific tasks or seek uh, volunteers and you know skilled areas that can really be a game changer so um, i'm hoping that um everyone can get some great results from that i'm going to speak very fast because we have uh, less than an hour to get through all these tips and i want to have um, an opportunity to, to talk through them as, as best as possible and um, feel free to put some questions in the um, chat box um, and Deepthi will um, interrupt me if um, and, and ask those questions if, if, she, uh, if they're kind of pertinent, if something that needs to be said, and if not, then we can um, happily answer some questions um, later on. Okay, so I am going to get straight into it. And uh, just as introduction to me, I am a, working in the nonprofit sector for uh, over 17 years and I've worked with organizations really all over the world. And um, my main area of, of focus is really helping particularly smaller organizations, organizations without huge resources in fundraising, without huge resources in, in, in operations to kind of do the best that they can. So I'm very kind of keen on finding those um, little obstacles that can really uh, get in our way and, and stop us from um, raising a lot of money or achieving really the organizational goals. And that's what this morning is really about. Um, we titled this uh, session 10 Fundraising Mega Tips and Moving Beyond the A to Z of Fundraising. And I guess that's all about anyone can co come up with ideas for fundraising. We can all come up with a raffle or come up with a run or a ball or a direct marketing campaign or anything like that. Like that's the easy bit. And really I wanted to focus on the, the little pieces of work that you can do before, during and after the kind of campaigns that gives you a better um opportunity or better likelihood of actually succeeding and what I find is even with the biggest organizations that sometimes they're 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 missing out on some of those basics some of those foundations that if they got right it would make their communication better it would make their campaigns land better and ultimately engage with more uh, donors engage with more supporters and you know make more money so and um, that's what we want to really um speak about this morning okay no challenge at all Okay, so the first thing, as I said, is before you start, before you start fundraising. Now, obviously, you've already been fundraising, so let's pretend in the world that you haven't started at all um, and that it's not too late because it's never too late. But I want you to kind of think about making sure that at a fundamental level, you have some of these key questions asked and not just you as maybe the fundraiser in the organization, but all the volunteers, your organization, your senior leadership team, your board, all of your staff, can everybody in the, org in the organization really have these kind of questions um, embedded in, in, in their understanding? The first one is, why do you exist? Why does your organization um, actually 
get up in the morning or why do you get up in the morning? What is the motivation? Um, if you are an organization that provides um, counseling to survivors of, of, a, of a particular disease or if you provide training in a particular area, that's not the reason why you exist. The reason you exist is because there was a lack of those things. You know, so um, do you exist because there are 25,000 people diagnosed with cancer in Ireland every year? Do you exist because there are uh, children going to school hungry every day? Do you exist because um, you know, we need to leave the planet in a better situation than it currently is? You exist because of something. And then your organization was set up to do something about that. So there is that impetus of we exist because. So forget all of this conversation about we were founded in 1963 by a volunteer committee. Nobody cares about that. We exist because of this really crucial thing in society and we've then decided to do something about it, okay? Number one, we exist because. Number two, then what are you gonna do about it? This is how we solve the problem. So we exist because there are children going to school every day with empty bellies and they're hungry. What do we do? We provide a breakfast service where any child can come in and get a, you know, a nutritious breakfast so that they go to school energized and not hungry and they're able to focus on their education. So you know, we, ex we exist because of a reason and then this is what we do. So you're highlighting to your supporters, to your donors, why you are important. And it's a very simple step-by-step -step process. And often we get into these kind of mistakes of saying, oh, well, we have a Monday to Friday, we provide a lunch service. And we also have a counseling service. We have an outreach program. All of that things, all of those kind of different message, messages are confusing. Think very clearly, you know, why do we exist? We exist because of this particular challenge. What are we going to do about it? We provide meals for kids going to school. We um, are taking homeless people off the streets and providing them with beds every night. We uh, provide training for family carers so that they feel less isolated and alone. Okay, now, I'm, now I understand. So mega tip number two, what do you do? Specifically, what are you doing about the problem that you set out to challenge, to solve? And then this sounds re really crass. And I often ask this to organizations, why should I care? You know, I've got lots of stuff on my mind. I have, you know, I'm worried about, you know, getting my kids to school right, right before this call. You know, I'm worried about my, my, my dad and whether he's well enough. I'm worried about paying my mortgage, all those kind of things. So why should I care about you? So you have to be able to connect your cause with people. So it's like, you know, we exist because there are children going to school on empty tummies. We provide um, nutritious breakfast for those kids so that they can actually um, um, receive you know, a good education and that they're engaged when they get to school. So why should I care? Because I know that you, are a, that you, you're a, you have a family and that you would hate to think that there is kids just like yours going to school on an empty tummy. Or um, I sh you should care because you're a business in this community and we, we, all, we all understand that as a community, we have to support those who are less and well off by less well off than us or you know why should, why should I care because you care about children so you need to be able to connect me to the cause why is it is it important to me it's not good enough to just say you know kids are going to school on empty tummies and I'm going okay well that's their parents problem that's not mine it's like well you know as a society we have to look after the weakest in our in our community or as a business owner, you want to support those. Or as a member of the local local council, we know that you know when kids get disruptive in school, then maybe they get um, suspended or expelled, and then you have um, you know un un unsatisfactory behavior happening in the streets, which leads to further problems in society. So you know you, you have to connect your cause to the people. So they're they're the first three tips that we've got, and we're really flying through them, which is which is awesome because some of them are deeper. So this is before you ask for a penny, before you ask for a volunteer, before you re reach out to a business looking for support. We exist because of these reasons. This is what we're trying to do to solve that problem. And we think it's important to you because of this. You care about the same things that we do. We care about the kids going to school hungry. And I know that you care about those too. Yeah, you care, uh, we care about um, leaving the, the world in a better place than we found it. And we know that's important to your company. So whatever those connections are, 
make them. And every single person associated with your organization needs to be able to do that. It's not something that needs to be crafted. It's not something that needs to be written in um, the perfect language. It's not something that has to be embedded in you so that if um, your one of your board members is sitting at home at the dinner table and one of their, their, their family says, what is that organization involved with? Kind of go, oh, that's interesting. We're, what we're trying to do is this. We exist because of these core issues. This is what we're trying to do to solve it. And it's really important because these, these things it should just be click of your fingers and it rolls off the tongue. And if you get to that stage, then fundraising is easy because you're, it's easier to connect with people. Okay, so that's before we started planning. Now we have to make a plan. Um, and we have to look at, you know, who's responsible for delivering our plan? What are the resources that we have to within our organization to make this plan a success? Um, and how we make decisions on what type of campaigns, what type of events, what type of activities we're going to do. So um, the, this is the phrase that makes me rage. I hear it from board members. I hear it from CEOs. I hear it from directors of services. Yeah, yeah, I don't need to worry about that fundraising stuff. I think you're great. You know, I think you're really entertaining and you're very funny. But don't worry, we have a fundraising team. They'll take care of all that. No, absolutely 100% no. The responsibility for uh, fundraising for an organization needs to and will only be successful when everybody attached to your organization feels an ownership, feels a belonging, feels um, empowered to fundraise. Think about the most successful fundraising organizations out there. Um, I mean, if you want to, like, if you want to think of the Irish Cancer Society, you want to think of Greenpeace, you want to think of World Wildlife Fund, you want to think of the Red Cross, any of these kind of major organizations that we all feel compelled to support. Like, why do I feel compelled to run a marathon for a, a given cause? Why do I feel that my company should make a donation to um, a, a cause that I believe in? Because I feel a responsibility to fundraise for it. And so that's an interesting thing. So if the organization then has communicated really well to me that they need me, that it's my responsibility. If I care about that cause, thinking back to our last slides, if I care about this, the mission of this organization, well, then it's my responsibility to fundraise. And that has to happen both internally and externally. So it's not good enough to leave it all up to just the fundraising team. <clears throat> so number four, every person involved with your organization, your staff, your board members, the volunteers, and not just fundraising volunteers, the volunteers who are you know, delivering meals to the, the elderly around your community, whatever they're doing, they have a role and um, the beneficiaries, the people who are in receipt of, of your, um, your work. So whether it's those kids that are, um, you know, getting warm meals or whether it's, you know, um, uh, family carers who are receiving your training, they have a role to play in fundraising. Does that mean we're going to ask them to make a donation? Maybe, maybe not, <clears throat> but they have a role to play. Like their story is important to help you connect with um, the wider public. Um, it's the board member's responsibility to connect you with businesses, to major donors, to um, skilled people who maybe could help you. It's all of the staff's um, responsibility, to, again, to find stories, to bring you ideas, to engage with fundraising, to share on their social media. So everybody has a responsibility. And until the whole organization and everyone associated, everyone who believes in your cause understands that, then again, it's harder for you to make that impact that you really want to make. So number four, every person involved with your organization has a role in fundraising. Number five, wow, I'm, I'm quicker than I think I, think I am. I, mean, I, should, I should catch a breath. Okay, number five. And this is a really critical one that we sometimes forget. And it's like, what resources do we have as an organization? Often we jump straight into um, brainstorming like oh we should do this we should do that and um, you know we should have a big event we should do a direct mail campaign or oh we need something we need an online trending kind of um, thing to jump on whoa hit the brakes before you get into the brainstorming and again these are all before the brainstorming have a look and see what have you what are you bringing to the table um so when I say what resources you have I mean 
money? Like, that's a big thing, first off. But have you got money to invest in direct marketing? Do you have money to invest in new staff, for instance? So money, or do you have none? So you need to, you need to have a good idea of what have you got to spend? What skills do you have? And this is, again, where we get back to the last side. See, they're all interconnected. Everybody has a role to play. So if you're the only fundraiser in, in an organization, what skills do you have? Okay, so maybe you come from an events background. So, um, you know, you're really good at organizing events. So if you want to develop a corporate fundraising campaign and you're like, well, I don't have those skills. Well, do, are those skills in your organization? Maybe on your board, there's someone who's into corporate sales training and you're like, well, either they could, you know, head up a, a corporate campaign for us or maybe they can train me and give me some of the skills to do that. So what skills do we have? What experience do we have in the organization? Maybe some of our staff have worked in other organizations and um, other nonprofit organizations and they're able to kind of go, oh, well, um, previously in the organization I work with, they had this type of campaign or they use their volunteers in this way. Okay, well, that's an interesting thing. So what are the assets that we have in our, amongst our staff that we can then use. If we do a whole survey of all the staff skills and abilities and it work, and it turns out that no one knows how to switch on a computer or, or use social media, then before we even start doing a brainstorm, we know that we're not going to do a social media campaign because we don't actually have those skills. And we've re already identified we haven't any money, so we can't bring in someone ex external to do that. So it puts it to bin, it puts it to bed straight away, puts it in the bin. So understanding what assets we have is really critical. And it's the same way as like, what's our reputation? Can we, can we leverage our reputation? Do we have a great database? We, maybe we haven't used it much, but we've built up over years, thousands of people on our database. You know, do we have, we signed up for somebody like Godera? So, okay, well, we're not really sure how that works at the moment, but we signed up, we went to a webinar and we know that there is an ability to connect in with corporates. So that's a resource that we have. So we have the access to reach uh, the corporate partners of Gajura. So that's maybe something that we need to think about. Well, we, well, can we use access some skills? So maybe there's some marketing people, maybe there's some corporate trainers, maybe there's some um, brand experts there that we could reach out to. Or maybe if we come up with a, a, a campaign that involves a lot of volunteering, then maybe we can recruit some corporate volunteers that way. So what are the resources that are sitting within your organization that you can maximize. Again, this is critical to the success of your fundraising because without knowing that, then how can you judge the likelihood of your idea of success? So number five, what resources does your organization have? Really, let's be honest, no, no webinar is um, complete unless we have a Steve Jobs quote, but I think this is actually a really important thing. Often people get um, either trapped in this, we don't know what to do, we can't do anything, or they kind of go, oh, well, there's so many ideas, let's try and do them all. Neither one of those is, a, is going to be a great solution. We need to be able to work out what's most likely to work, what can we work on, and um, how, can we, how can we succeed? So understanding um, what we can do, what we should do is really, really vital. Let's be honest, this is, even a, this is even a small sample of the different types of fundraising that you can do. So when you actually sit down and how I would do it and when, how, I would, how I would plan my fundraising is like, I've, <clears throat> I've done all those previous pieces. I know what my resources are. I know exactly what my organization is trying to achieve. I know how much money I have to spend. I know what my targets are from a fundraising point of view. Now I'm going to throw down all the ideas. I'll probably go, literally, I'll probably go through as many of these categories as I can and say, okay, well, in a community fundraising, what should we do in community fundraising? Oh, we should do this event. We should do that event. Okay, corporate fundraising. Oh, well, we have some client, we have some corporate partners from before. So maybe we'd like to do something with those. Direct marketing, we've been doing that for a few years. So I would literally go through all those different areas and throw down ideas that I'd like to do, like to um, consider not commit to, just consider lots and lots of ideas. I don't believe in, you know, let's just focus on one right from the very start and just commit to it because you need to pull it apart a little bit. So throw down as many ideas as you can and then kind of go, well, what do I think might work for you? So the number six, number six, the sixth uh, fundraising mega tip is rate 
every potential fundraising idea against this is my criteria you can pick your own innovation practicality organization's ability to deliver a return on investment of money and time and fit for a philosophy so here's what i here's what i mean by doing this we all are biased so we've sat down and we've had a brainstorming idea. You know, we've had this, one of these great brainstorming ideas. We've got pizza in. We've had a really exciting facilitator like me come in and go, oh, guys, you could do this. What about that? And you've gotten loads of post-its and you've stuck them all over the walls. and Everyone's really excited. That's brilliant because you need that energy. But what we also then need to do is be able to find, figure out a way of working out what's the, what's the best fit for organization or the number of it or the different no, type of, or a number of ideas or activities that are a good fit for organization but without getting too precious about them without making mistakes what I happen well, this is me what happens with me is that I get hooked on an idea I read about it in the chronicle of philanthropy or I see it on tv or I come up with it myself like this is it this is the best idea this will definitely work and I find it hard to then see other people's ideas. And we're all like that. So we need to come up with a, a way of measuring our ideas, reviewing our brainstorming in a cold clinical way. So what I do is I rate all of the ideas against these set criteria. Um, different organizations choose different criteria, but this is what works for me. So I sit down with my 20 ideas that we've come up with in our brainstorming. Some of them are ridiculous. Some of them are really interesting. Some of them we don't quite understand. It doesn't matter. They can be ones with, they, they can be activities we've done before that we want to like, oh, well, you know what? That run has worked really well for us every year. So we're not going to stop doing it now. So it could be the like, it could be something that we've done before, but we want to rate all our ideas. So um we're looking at our wall we're gonna we're gonna do a 10k run in july okay well that's this is the idea that's on the table a 10k run in july okay first off is it innovative well no there's been lots of there's been lots of uh, other runs that have happened um over the years but you know in our town in our community there's no other runs in the during the summer there's no other 10k charity runs in the summer so it's not necessarily innovative but it is relatively unique within our market. So we'll give it a three out of five or four out of five, okay? Is it practical? Okay, well, a run is relatively practical. We have a route worked out from before. So um, we know that people like to come. We, we know how that works. Okay, so practical, yeah, it's, still a, it's a good bit of work, but you know, four out of five from a practicality point of view. Our organization's ability to deliver. So do we have the ability to deliver on this run? Well, actually, we've done it before, so we know how to do it. We've had 100 people uh, participate before. To be honest, in the last couple of years, it's been a huge effort. And if we want to grow this event and raise more money, well, we're going to have to bring in some extra resources because we were really, really stretched. So I'm actually going to give it a three out of five because while... It's something that's worked before and we can do it. I'm not sure if we can really grow it. Return on investment of money and time. So how much time is it going to take for us to organize this run? We have a good idea from previous experience. It's going to take us two or three months to organize this run. And, the, um, and then how much money does it make? Well, we get a lot of food, we get t-shirts, all those kind of things donated. So we don't have much upfront costs. Um, and it turns out that, you know, the local community really got behind it and we raised quite a lot of money. So return on investment of money and time is, again, a four out of five. And then fit for philosophy. And this is, to me, this is, again, helping me connect with my audience, connect with my um, potential donors. Does it fit? And this is a tricky one because sometimes, you know, how can a run fit with an organization? And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But if you are a health-based organization, so if you are a, uh, or you know, a health or a mental health based organization and you can kind of go well we're promoting exercise and we all know that you know running physical activity is good for our physical health and our mental health so okay yeah we're promoting those as two important things as part of the philosophy of our organization so absolutely a run fit so we can say a four out of five for that and um, maybe if you were um, a, an organization that predominantly cared for the elderly or um Maybe, maybe physically disabled people, it might be difficult to kind of go, well, that doesn't make any sense because the older people can't really run. So does that really connect with you with the philosophy? Okay, well, maybe then that's a two out of five. So 
I score all of my all of my ideas in the same way, score them out of five, and then I pick the ones that score the highest, not the ones that I like the most, not the ones that sound the most exciting, but the ones that are practical, are going to raise the more money, that fit for what we're trying to do, and they're the ones I do. I don't care whether, oh, that uh, this idea was the chairperson's and we have to keep him or her happy or whatever happens to be. I just focus on the ones that are going to work. Um, I find this a great way of really helping just narrow down, making sure that we have the ability to deliver it, that it's going to raise the money that we need and that it's actually going to work. So six mega tip, rate every potential fundraising idea against a set, um, a set criteria, and then just pick the best scoring one. Um, actually, I'm gonna take, a, just have a quick look on the chat and see if there's any questions just while I'm, I'm going. Okay, if there's any, um, okay, don't think there's any at the moment, that's okay, let's keep going. Okay, this is harking back a little bit to where we, where we started, and it's why we started that way. If you remember back at the start of the session, we talked about the problem that, you know, um, why do we exist? You know, what is the problem that's facing society? What are we doing about it? And then why should I care? That's the fundraising. That's part of the fundraising equation. The funding, fundraising equation is problem, solution, hero. Okay, I'm struggling with my camera. <laughs> problem, solution, hero. The problem, there are children going to school hungry in our town every day. That's a problem. I understand that. The solution we provide, you know, we have um, a breakfast club for kids providing um, food so that they're able, so that they don't go to school with an empty tummy. The hero, you, the donor, you know, you can feed twenty children in our community every day if you're willing to contribute a thousand euro every month or whatever it happens to be. Problem, solution, hero. The hero is always the donor always the donor. So what is the problem you're working on? What is your solution to the problem? And then how can I be a hero? I can volunteer for your organization. I can make a contribution every month. I can give you 10,000 euro towards a news center, whatever happens to be problem, solution, hero. That's the fundraising equation. But my mega tip is not the fundraising equation. It's how to ask for money. The magic arrow, okay. First things first is it's called the magic arrow because I couldn't think of a better name for it when I first developed this um, a few years ago. Um, it's stuck, it's embarrassing, but it is what it is. Um, it's really hard to ask for money. We beat around the bush, we stall, we um, stumble, we mutter, we go off the point, or certainly I do. Um, and the obvious solution to that is let's write a script, you know, where I kind of write my points down in like, you know, hello, um, this is what I'm saying, you know, bang, 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 this whole big script. And that feels st stunted, it feels awkward, it feels uncomfortable. And I wanted to try and figure out a way that I could get to the point of asking people for money or asking for their support, but that it didn't feel forced. It got to all the main points. And it was a more natural type of conversation. So I, I kind of came up with this arrow. So let's think back to our, um, let's think back to our, our kids club, our breakfast club. I don't know why I've come up with this idea, but I have. Okay, so, you know, maybe it's a phone call. I'm like, hi, I'm Kevin and I'm working for the um, Navin Breakfast Club. Um, I care about ensuring that kids go to school with full tummies, ready for the ready to concentrate the day because I know that an education is the key to people getting themselves out of poverty, to having you know successful, happy, and fulfilled lives. And I really want to ensure that every child in our community um, can go to bed with a full or go to school with a full tummy and really engage with their education because it's important to me. I really believe that if we can, as a community, support all of the kids in, in the community and make sure that they are, are going to school with full tummies, that number one, they're gonna feel engaged with their community. They're gonna have a great education. 
They're going to feel that they're wanted. They're going to feel supported by, by the community. And therefore, they're going to, you know, cause less problems, you know, out and about on the streets. They're going to be engaged. They're going to get a good education. They're going to contribute in class. And ultimately, it's going to make a difference to their lives and all of our lives in the wider community. I think this is something that you would like to support because as a business in the community, you understand the importance of us all supporting each other. If, the if you know, members of the community spend money in your business, you do better. If you give back to the community, give back to the kids, then the ho whole community is doing better. And I think that's something that would really matter to you as a business owner. Will you make a donation of 5,000 euro this year to support the Navan Breakfast Club? Now, I'm making that up on the whim. You have time to practice that and, and, and fine tune it. I'm gonna give you the three important, well, I keep holding up my fingers. The three most important things about this, the magic arrow are this, I. You don't start a conversation saying, we are this, we are that, we're going to do that. No, 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 I, because I'm a person. I work for this organization. I believe in the cause. I've seen the impact of our work. It breaks my heart when I see kids going to school hungry. Me, me, I, 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 I'm a person. Be a person. Don't ever be an organization. And then it, swips to, it flips to you. It doesn't say, I think your organization. I think it's like, I think you would care about that. And maybe you'd like to get your organization to support it. Or I think, you know, you as a business owner and part of this community understand the importance of our work. So because, again, I'm, as, I'm a person and so is the person you're speaking to on the phone. So I, 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 you, you, you. And then the final thing and the simplest secret of all, all of sales, all of asking is like, will you make a donation of 5,000 euro today? And then shut up. Don't say, would you make a donation of 5,000 euro today? Now, don't worry. If you haven't got 5,000 euro, that's no problem. 1,000 euro is fine. No, no. Throw the question out there. Let it land and then wait. Would you make a donation of 5,000 euro today? Actually, 5,000 euro? You're crazy. I haven't got 5,000 euro. That's no problem, of course. Like, how much would you feel comfortable at? Oh, um, oh well, then maybe 1,000 euro. Okay, great. No problem at all. We really appreciate that. Thank you very much. So let, give a space for your potential donor to answer, whether it's 50 euro, 500 euro, 5,000 euro. So I, you, and then um, will you give it and make a donation of X amount and shut up. So the number seven mega tip is the magic arrow. Have a set structure for asking, make it personal, and then ask um, and see how you go. Hey, Kevin, sorry to interrupt, but there are a couple yeah, of great for... questions in the chat awesome. window. So can we answer those? OK, no problem. Hope I can. Um, OK, I'll just go to the first one. Uh, do you have any tips on how we can get trustees on board with fundraising and getting across this is responsibility for everyone in, in the organization? Um, yes, I have a, actually a really great tip for, um, for trustees or board of directors. Um, Obviously, you have to kind of, you, one of the areas where why boards don't engage, it's, all, it's always our fault. It's our job because the board, the, board, the board of directors, the trustees are volunteers, and it's up to us to, to keep them engaged. And often they get caught up in the finance and the governance, all the kind of stuff that they have to do. So one thing I would do is if you're going to have a fundraising session with your board, and again, get them involved, get their ideas, all that kind of stuff, but start off in a simple way. Bring in some cards. And like, you know, thank you cards, like blank cards with envelopes. They have, you know, postcards with envelopes. That's, that's all you need. It doesn't matter what's on them. And pass them around to all of the, the trustees. And before you start your session, just say, you know, what I'd like you to do is write down on this card the reason why you got involved in this organization in the first place, why you give up your time every month or every two months, you know, why you think it's important. Just write that down on the card. Um, you know, it's a personal thing. I'm not asking you to share, I'm not asking you to, to, to speak about it. I just want you to think back to why you joined this board and why you uh, think it's important. And they'll, they'll do that. And then you say, okay, what I'd like you to do is see, put that card in the envelope and seal it up. We're not asking you to share it. But all I'm asking you to do is that, you know, put it in your diary, put it in your notebook, 
you know, so when you're coming to these meetings the next time, every time you come to a board meeting, anytime you're engaged with us as an organization, you know, just look at that card, it's sealed in the envelope, but you know what it says, and just remind yourself why it's important that we commit to this organization. That alone will help them just engage with why it's important to, to do that a little bit more, why they really care, because they get distracted by all the government. So, you know, that's a simple tip that I found that really helps them engaging, really helps them getting on, getting on board and kind of just connecting a bit more. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of other stuff, but you know, for now, I think that's actually something that really, really works uh, just to help them get out of their finance head and get out of their uh, governance head. And I'm just going to move on to the next question. As a charity that provides itself on giving 99% of donations to the cause we care about, how do you convince donors that investing some of their funds in marketing or even employing someone can also be a good return on their donation, like allowing us to generate more, even more funds for the children in need? Um, it's a good question. And in some ways, it's, 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 a, it's a, a chicken and egg. It's not a great idea to push out this whole kind of thing about, you know, 99% of all the funds we get goes directly towards the cause because it's very hard to measure that. Um, at the end of the day, it's about how, how you can achieve more. And I think that it's, it's having that open and honest conversation about uh, with your donors about how you're going to spend the money. So rather than saying, um, rather than focusing on the actual money that's spent um, on, whether it's on marketing, whether it's on fundraising, whether it's on staff, it's actually talking about, um, last year we helped you know a thousand people um in over the next two years we want to increase that um to two thousand people and in order to do that we need to raise you know this much money and we're going to invest this much so you're actually explaining to them in in achieve in what's the goal you're trying to achieve you're trying to achieve helping more people reaching more people reaching more children and how we get there is Obviously, we're going to have to spend some money. Obviously, if we're going to help more people, we're going to have to increase staff. That's fine. We're going to help more people. So switching your message to actually what your goal is and how many people you're actually going to achieve rather than focusing on these on the percentage of those donations and stuff, because actually people don't care about that. They'll tell you that they do. I mean, if you ask people, if you ask donors about, you know, do how much they value transparency, how all those kind of things, um, They'll say, oh, absolutely. We want to make sure all of our money goes to the cause. We want to see charts of how our expenses are going. They don't. They want to see that the 20 euro they gave, the 50 euro they gave, the 1,000 euro they gave is impacting on people's lives. So if you focus on the impact, focus on how much more impact you want to do, and then you just say, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it by investing in fundraising where we're going to hire a new person or we have a marketing campaign, but we're confident that over the next two years, that's going to int into... Uh, reach more money um, that's what's going to happen so hope that helps again i can talk about that um, at a later date in more detail but and um, that's how i would do that um, okay Ooh, okay well i can't believe we're actually on schedule this is phenomenal and any more questions uh, feel free to stick them in the box and we'll get to them at the end so donor care um, what is donor care? So if you think about what we've done, so we've talked about before we started fundraising, we've talked about um, you know, how we actually decide on fundraising and, and ho how we decide on activities that are likely to make a big impact um, on your organization. But one of the, the key things, again, that we forget, that we don't put the, put the work into is donor care. What is donor care? Donor care is making someone feel that their money was appreciated. It is so hard to get people to donate. Now, obviously, when you listen to me, it becomes much easier, but it's still really hard um, because it takes an effort. You've got to go ask corporates individually. You've got to find them. You've got to set up meetings. You've got to reach out to the general public and get them to engage with you. Like That's hard. That's really hard work. If someone then has a good experience with donating to you, if they feel good about it, if they feel their 50 euro made an impact on children, um, in need and they went to, went to, to, to feed um, kids on their way to school or if they feel that their monthly contribution of 21 euro is really going towards prevent, saving the environment and they feel that they're making an impact and that they're part of a movement and that they're really making an impact on society then they'll keep giving and you going back to them and asking for more money is actually excuse me, it's actually way easier because they're like, wow, well, the last time I gave money, I got this lovely card. I felt really good about myself. 
yeah, I'd like I'd like that feeling again. We're we're creatures of habit. I want more of that. It's like it's like no one can resist you know the second square of chocolate. Like once you've had one mouthful of chocolate, you know the bar is gone because it feels good, it tastes good, you feel amazing, and that's what you kind of want from your donors. So donor care is about making your donors feel loved, making them feel wanted, making them feel that they're having an impact on the world around them. So, okay, we're gonna go. Eight, uh, eight, nine, and 10 is donor care before, during, and after the, the, the campaign. Number eight is taking the time before you fundraise to think about how you're going to look after your donors. I made this mistake like so majorly. I um, first time I ever did a direct marketing campaign, we sent like a hundred thousand packs. Like obviously I went in all in, never done direct marketing in my life. We went with a hundred thousand packs and um, <clears throat> received whatever it was, three and a half thousand, four thousand um, donations in response. Great, great, we're delighted with the response. I had no concept of how many letters were gonna come back and how many donations were gonna come back and how I was physically going to process those donations. So what happened was the donations were piling up on my desk and people were waiting a week, two weeks, three weeks to get an acknowledgement. Then they were worried that um, the check that they sent in the post hadn't got, gotten to the organization. They were phoning up saying, did you get that check? And like, oh, actually, I'm not sure because I've got a big pile of unopened envelopes. It was a disaster. My donor care was appalling. So the people who were inspired by our ask loved the letter that we sent out to them or felt really uh, compelled to make a donation. Now we're feeling like, oh, Maybe I, maybe I did the wrong thing because maybe they're not able to support, maybe they're not able to cope with the donation. So I, I damaged that relationship. So before, think about your donor. Think about them sitting at their desk, sitting at their kitchen table, wherever it happens to be, and think about like, what am I asking them to do? Am I asking them to sign a direct debit? Am I asking them through their company to make a large donation? Am I asking them to commit, commit to a multi-year contribution? What am I asking them to do? Okay, is that really clear? Don't give me, don't give a donor 14 different ideas. You could give five euro for this or 50 euro will give you this or two and a half thousand euro will this. If you commit to a direct debit, you're like, so don't give me 25 different options because I'm like, well, what do you want? Do you want five euro now? Or do you want me to give you 20 euro a month? Like what, what's most impactful for you? So you know, what are you asking me for do, me to do? So if you, if you want 50 euro, your gift of 50 euro today will ensure that a, a kid is fed breakfast for a month. You can, uh, underneath that, you can kind of go, or you'd like, or a gift of your, whatever you'd like or whatever happens to be. But you know, what am I asking for? I'm asking for 50 euro right now. Okay, understand. Why am I asking you to do this? I'm, oh, 50 euro to feed a child uh, for breakfast for a month. Okay, I understand that. How do you want me to do it? Well, oh, very clearly on our form, I'm asking you to go to the website, you know, whatever, www, blah, 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 forward slash donate and put in my details. Okay, I understand you'd like me to go online and make a credit card donation. And then what will I do next? You will receive a thank you in the, you know, in the post, um, and we will use your money, you know, to feed kids and we'll send you a follow up to let you know how the campaign has gone, blah, blah, blah. So before I've asked for the money, I've thought about what, you know, what am I asking my donors to do? I'm asking them to make a donation. I'm asking me, I, I've told them why I'm asking you for, the, for this donation. I've told them how I'd like them to make the donation. And then I'm going to tell them what I'm going to do with that, that donation. So this is before I've asked them for money. This is donor care. So now a donor is kind of very clear. They're very comfortable. I love what this organization is doing. I understand what they'd like me to do. I, I feel comfortable doing that. And now I know when, if, I, if I give them that money, what are they going to do with it? Great. I feel confident. I'm likely to give. Number nine, almost there. Okay, amazing. During your don during the campaign, whether it's an event, whether it's a direct marketing campaign, whether it's a corporate recruitment campaign, whether it's Christmas, you know, it's the critical time. It's it's the this is the time when your their your relationship with your donor is most fragile. You've sold them on a dream. You've sold them on an ambition. You've got them really excited. You've got them really emotional. 
but it's like you know it's like inviting somebody out on a date you know it's like you've you've got them to commit to you you've kind of got you've got them to go well, okay i'll give you a chance but now you got to impress me you got to make me feel that it was worth my time going for dinner with you whatever happens to be why am i talking about dates i don't know um you know what but it, that's what it is it's a relationship you're building relationships so i've convinced you that you're worth I've convinced the donor that I'm worth the donation, but now exactly like I'm saying here. So how am I going to manage the donations? What do I expect the volume to be like? Am I going to get one donation a day? Am I going to get 150 donations a day for three weeks? Okay. Well, what does that look like? Have I, am I going to have to have two or three of the other staff to help me process those so that I can make sure that someone's getting a thank you the next day? Um, how am I going to do that? Or, do you know, we're not going to be able to process them. Do you know, our system just is really clunky. So what we're going to do is every donation that comes in, we're just going to, we're going to have some pre-printed thank you cards that we can just write someone's address and send out, you know, thank you for your donation. We'll, you know, a further acknowledgement will follow. So just so that people know, oh, they got my check and I see they're going to process it and they'll send me more details later. It's communication. So what am I going to do? How am I going to support the donors when they send that donation? So how am I going to manage the, the donation? How am I going to acknowledge them? How am I going to say thank you? What's that letter going to contain? Is it, if this letter talks about Mary, who's going to school, an empty tummy, his little kid, and you kind of go, you know, is it going to include an update? You know, thanks to people just like you, um, Mary is going to be able to continue to come to our breakfast club every day. And she's doing much better in school. And the teachers say she's really engaged and she's really flourishing and she's got a happy future. Is that what you're going to put in your thank you letter? Maybe. Or is it, are you just going to say, it's, you know, it's Christmas. Are you, are you just going to say, you know, thank you for your donation. We really want to wish you and all your family and all, and, you know, a very happy Christmas. And we'll be in touch with you in the new year and let you know how, you know, our campaign is going. What are you going to say? How are you going to make them feel special? So are you going to have a little something to go into your thank you? Maybe it's a, a postcard, it, you know, it's something that they can stick on their fridge. Or is the letter just going to make them feel special? Is the letter going to move beyond um, thank you for your donation? Is it going to be like, wow? I mean, literally, is your letter going to say, wow, I'm so grateful your contribution has made our day it's going to impact people's lives i can't wait to use your money to help these kids and i can't wait to tell you the impact you're making how's that, how am i going to feel if i'm a donor and i receive that type of acknowledgement and um, <clears throat> the two things i would say about uh, the, the, during a campaign and accept and, and in processing donations is you're competing about it with everybody else. So I don't care if you are a tiny organization with all volunteers or whether you're a major um, international organization, you need to thank everybody who makes a donation to your organization. And I like this kind of cut off is like, we only send thank yous to people who give over 10 euro. That's BS, that's wrong. Somebody might give you a donation of two euro and maybe the stamp to send a thank you is going to cost you a euro, but they deserve that acknowledgement as much as the person who gives you a thousand euro because you have no idea how much that two euro meant to them. Maybe that's all they had to give. Maybe it might like it really touched them. Maybe they're like literally they gave you every penny that they had and it was only two euro and they deserve the respect as a donor. They gave everything they have. And also maybe the two euros a test. Maybe they want to see how I how you do it. What sort of organization am I working with? Do they really share my values? And by you writing out and saying, thank you so much for a two euro donation. We really appreciate it. And, and it is going to make an impact. All donations, no matter how small, really make a difference. Because maybe they've got 20,000 euro in a check waiting to see if the, you, you can respond properly. So thank everybody um, and do it as fast as possible. When I'm thanking, when I'm doing donor acknowledgements, whether it's you know online, uh, uh, online donations, corporate donations, you know, um, any type of donations, my target is um, that a thank you letter, an acknowledgement letter, goes out the same day I receive the donation. So if it, if a check for a five hundred euro comes in the post at ten o'clock in the morning, 
by lunchtime, I have a thank you going out in the post that's specific. It has, has the amount, it has the person's details. The CEO has signed it. And there's a little note to say, thank you so much. Whatever happens to be, it goes straight out. So that, because you have to think of the impact. Someone's taken a chance on you. They've got, God, I think this work is amazing. You know, I'll give them a hundred euro. You don't want them to doubt for even a second they're doing the wrong thing. So they put it in the post on a Monday. It arrives at you on the Tuesday. Wednesday morning, they open their mail and say, thank you. They're like, wow, they're efficient. They really know about that. They really appreciate that donation. They were straight on it. I now I feel that my trust in this organization was justified. So number 10, think about how you're, or nine, how are you going to support your donors through the donation process? And then finally, donor care after. We said get, getting a donor is hard and keeping them as, as much is, is the easiest way to make sure your, your donations continue to grow and that your fundraising continues to grow. So think about how you're going to keep your donors engaged. They've taken a chance on you. They've made a donation. You've thanked them really well. Now what? You don't want to wait until like 10 months time when you go back to them again and ask them for another donation. So follow up. How did that Christmas campaign go? Did you raise the 10,000 euro in order to ensure your uh, breakfast club runs for the first six months of the year? Have you got some pictures of the kids that eating their breakfast and happy smiling faces? Do you have a letter from the school principal to say, um, wow, the kids who are coming to breakfast club are really engaged. The teachers are saying that they're doing brilliant in school. Have you got something like that? Because the donors would love that. The donors would love to get a letter from a school principal to say, we just want to thank all your supporters for uh, providing the, the breakfast club. It's making a huge difference in the kids' lives. And from myself and the teachers, we want to thank you for your support. Your donors would love that because you fulfilled a promise. You promised that if they gave you money that you would have an impact on people's lives. And here's the evidence that you did. So send that letter a month, two months, three months later. You know, this is just feedback. You know, did the child get the help that it needed? Did you build the new center that you were trying to do? What was the impact of your donation? Your 50 euro made sure that one child was fed for an entire month. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe you didn't reach 10,000 euro. Maybe your target was 10,000 euro, you know, and you're, and you're writing out to people to say, thank you so much for your donation. As you know, we were hoping to raise 10,000 euro for our campaign. Unfortunately, we didn't. We, we, we raised 9,000 euro. We still, it's still a lot of money. We're still going to be able to make a huge impact on society. And it's thanks to you. So awesome. Really appreciate your support. But I tell you what, we still need to get that, to that goal. So now we have a new campaign um, launched and we're looking to raise, you know, an extra 5,000 or whatever it happens to be. So what's the next dream? What's the next ambition? Keep your donors engaged because think about the process. I've sold you on an idea. I sold you on a dream. I've bought into it. I kind of go, yeah, I care about the kids who are going to school hungry every day. That's something that matters to me. Here's some money. Help you solve that problem. You've now solved that problem. You've done exactly what you said you'd do. And now you're coming back to me and say, you know, the breakfast club is going great. But, you know, there's some kids in our, in our community who are going home to empty houses and we'd like to offer an after school program that would, again, help them get their homework done and give them some food. Um, and we want to launch a pilot for that. Is that something that you'd be interested in supporting? Well, do you know what? Yeah, I would. I felt amazing supporting you before. I really believe what you're doing and you're proving to me that you make an impact. So yeah, I'm, I'm in for that. I'll, 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 I'll donate to that. It's the next dream. And now you're in a relationship with your donor where you are asking for their support, selling them on a dream, fulfilling that dream. And now there's the next thing. And it can be a long, long, long time um, experience. So the donor care before, during, and after is vital. So the tenth mega tip is look after your donors after after the donation. It's the most critical time for that.